Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about tense and how different languages talk about time. But first, we are very excited to announce the launch of the Lingthusiasm Lingcom grant. Yes. When we started this podcast, we were fortunate to be in a position where we could put some of our own money into the project to get us off the ground until our lovely patrons started coming in. Now we're in a position where we want to pay it forward and we want to help the next generation of awesome pop linguistics projects find their feet. We're giving out a 500 US dollar grant to a project that helps communicate linguistics to a new audience. And with your help, if we reach 800 patrons by May 1st, we can give out three of these grants. Uh, so we're really looking forward to seeing the applications come in. Uh, applications are due June 1st, and you can see more details about the Lincom grant and how to apply on our website. We'll link to it from the show notes, and it's lincom.org, two M's in com. We know that some of you may be really passionate about the idea of there being more linguistics communication projects. Uh, out in the world, but don't have the time or the expertise. And so if you really want to help support us in the Lincom grants, we've created a new tier at the Patreon called Philanthropist. And for every person who supports us at $50 or more at that level, we'll drop the number of patrons that we need to meet the three grant goal down by 10. So you will be as effective as 10 other patrons. Don't feel like uh, you need to do this, but if you're somebody who, who has a has a real job uh, and this isn't a lot of money to you, then this is an interesting thing to do with it. And we'll also send you a Lingthusiast mug after three months at this tier so you can share your, your Lingthusiasm that way. And of course, patrons at any level will help us meet the 800 patron goal to give out three grants. If you're also excited about showing off that you're a Lingthusiast, we also have a new uh, sticker that says Lingthusiast, a person that's enthusiastic about linguistics, which we've added to the $15 level of the Patreon. So go check out the Patreon. Uh, we have new stuff there. Speaking of new stuff at the Patreon, we now have a Discord server for all our Lingthusiast and above tiers, uh, which is the first Discord server I've ever been on. So I'm learning a lot. <laughs> it's been really fun to see people join so quickly because there are actually a lot of people who are already joined uh, and are chatting about things like interesting linguistics links that you come across, uh, conlanging, learning languages, uh, linguistics memes. Uh, we even have a channel where you can talk to each other in the international phonetic alphabet, uh, which is a fun challenge, uh, and other interesting linguistics things that you come across uh, around the internet. So lots of different channels, all very enthusiastic, typing, chat. I feel like definitely has a like old days of the internet user group vibe that makes me really happy. It's been really fun to start hanging out there and I think people are really enjoying that. So join us in the Discord. Our current bonus for patrons is bonus content from our interview with Janelle Shane, in which we walk through creating a Lingthusiasm bot that generates Lingthusiasm transcripts. And we walked through that in detail, and then we read some of our favorites. So if you would like to hear what Lingthusiasm would sound like if it were written by a neural net, who is very enthusiastic, but doesn't really know that much about actual linguistics, but finds some keywords sometimes, uh, you can check that out. And definitely stay tuned for the part towards the end, uh, where we prompt the neural net with both Lingthusiasm and Harry Potter fan fiction, and you get the most magical Lingthusiasm episode ever. <laughs> this and 35 other bonus episodes at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. Okay, Gretchen, I'm going to do some real-life sentence elicitation so we can look at some examples of how tense works with time. Are you ready if I give you a bit of a prompt? Sure, let's go. Tell me about something that happened yesterday in the past. So I'm walking down the street yesterday, and I see this bird, right? And this bird starts coming towards me. Okay, I am definitely going to ask you about the rest of that story later. But for now, can I have an example of something that's happening or could be happening like right now in the present? 
Well, so let's pretend that I'm not just literally recording this podcast with you because that's a little bit too meta. But let's say I'm just sitting at home right now and I'm eating a delicious cake and you're drinking a cup of tea. Mm, right. I might, I might need to go get a cup of tea. But before I do that, let's have an example of something that is going to happen later in the future. So I'm going to the airport tomorrow. We fly out to Rome at 10 o'clock. We arrive the next morning and then. Are you really, are you going to Rome tomorrow? No, no, I'm not. I just, oh. it's the first place that I thought of. I'm not going anywhere. <sighs> but man, now I want a cup of tea and pizza. One of the things that I think is really interesting about these examples is that because uh, I am a bit of your confederate in this experiment, shall I say. Yeah, this is not naturalistic data at all. <laughs> Uh, because I've been briefed, um, one of the things that I was able to do is I was able to talk about something that happened yesterday and something that's happening right now and something that is going to happen tomorrow, but I was actually able to use the same forms of the verb for all of them. So let's do a little rewind. Right. So in the past, you use the verb. I'm walking down the street. I see this bird. Present. Uh, I'm sitting at home. I'm eating a delicious cake. And future. I'm going to the airport. We fly out to Rome. So uh, I think the answer is that the relationship between tense and time is not as straightforward as we might think it is, that you know, we don't have a past tense is always used with past events. Right. Normally, if you're in like a Ling 101 class and we're talking about tense or you're in like a language class and you're talking about tense and the definition that everyone gives about tense is, well, it means time. Yeah. And it kind of does, but it also kind of doesn't. And so this is the sort of complexity that we're going to be trying to unravel for the rest of this episode. We have something that's happening with grammar, and we're going to call that tense. And we have something that is happening with the flow of time that's in the real world where there is language being spoken or not. Time is still ticking on. And... I mean, we've talked about how to conceptualize time in, in an earlier episode, but just thinking about the flow of time and then tense as a grammatical construct that like relates to it, but doesn't perfectly map onto it. So what I was able to do in this experiment is I was able to use the English present tense to talk about actions in the past and in the present and in the future. But what's interesting is that, so English has another tense, which is the past tense, and I can't quite do all three of these things with the past tense. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of the future with the past tense. I sat at home right now is problematic. Like that, that has some tension there. And it gets really tricky if I want to say, I went to the airport tomorrow. That, hmm, no. I definitely don't have that as a valid utterance in my this real world, no time traveling sense of how language works. Right. So like putting time travel aside, this is not how, how English works. So many linguists talk about English as having two tenses, past and non-past. And what this means is that the non-past tense is the one that I can use to talk about any time space. And the past tense, I can only use to talk about the past. And that's why I'm able to say, I walked down the street yesterday, but not, I sat at home right now, or I went to the airport tomorrow. Because the past tense is really restricted, but the non-past tense can be in any of these times. It also speaks to something that I think sometimes people find a bit confronting about studying linguistics, which is that the way that they're taught the idea of grammar in English language classes or in grammar classes is that we have a past, present, and future. Mm. But from a linguistic analysis, English is treated as a language with a past and non-past distinction, and the non-past includes present and future constructions. And sometimes this like weird sort of version of the past that's used for storytelling purposes. So many kinds of past in English, you do actually want to use the past tense, but there's this one very specific storytelling thing where you can use the, the present, or more accurately, the non-past, even in something that happened in the past to make it seem more vivid and more sort of relevant to a particular current time. Um, you, you'd have a harder time saying something like, the Norman conquest of English happens in 1066. That would be a harder sell for English. You'd really want to say happened there. But you could say, I guess, so like, so William the Conqueror comes across the English Channel, right? And he's like, got this big ship. And they're using the present to make it very vivid. Mm, I'm, I, I feel so much more compelled when you use <laughs> that 
present in past. Right, and that makes it seem very vernacular and very storytelling-y and like I'm doing this sort of casual thing where you're not going to see it in like a traditional history textbook, but you might see it in a sort of like, you know, fun, vivid history podcast type thing. I was kind of surprised when I took an English grammar linguistics subject just how many different grammatical constructions around tense there are in English, because I had this very simple idea that there was like a past, present, future, dun, dun, dun. And it's like, oh, this is why the Cambridge Grammar of the English Language is such a massive book, because I hadn't really thought about the fact that the the tense that you use in that narrative past using the present form is like the time is in the past, but the tense is not just using a past tense. Right. And this is why it's useful to have, you know, why not just call it time if it's out, if tense just means time? Why not just say time? Well, it's because there's actually this difference in that a tense refers to specifically like a thing that is done in the shape of the language can be somewhat independent from what's actually going on in the world that you're referring to, as in the case where you use the present to talk about the past. That doesn't somehow make it the past. But what about the future, right? Because Lauren, it seems like English, we can definitely talk about the future. Yeah, and there are forms that I can talk about, like, I will go, well, I won't go to Rome, <laughs> but I will go to Rome tomorrow, or I'm going to go to Rome tomorrow. Like, I can do that for tomorrow in a way that I can't do it for yesterday. So there's something happening there. Right. And the analysis of this in English is that will and gonna are treated like other types of things where you can add these sort of semi-verbs. So if I wanted to say, I can go to Rome, I might go to Rome, I want to go to Rome, I have to go to Rome, I will go to Rome, I'm gonna go to Rome. Uh, all of these are uh, what the category of modals, but we're not going to get into the, the terminology here. Um, all of this sort of category of like, here's this additional word that you can add that adds a sort of additional information. And sometimes that's a time related piece of information, but sometimes that has to do with desires or possibilities or other types of additional sorts of meaning. And that's not how English talks about tense. English tense generally is something that's part of the, the verb itself, whereas this is this additional word that gets added, it's less obligatory in the future because it's it's a lot more legit to say, I fly to Rome tomorrow and I will fly to Rome tomorrow and I'm going to fly to Rome tomorrow. All of these are pretty good, you know? Whereas this case of I'm walking down the street yesterday is really this very one limited context with I fly to Rome tomorrow. There's a lot more places where you can use that and you don't have to do this thing with will. You have these other options like gonna or just using the the non-past form of the verb. So there's something about obligatoriness when it comes to tense. Right. And it kind of reminds me of, remember the episode where we talked about evidentiality and how some languages you have to indicate the source of evidence that you have for something and other languages you can indicate the source of evidence, but you don't have to. Yeah. And there's this kind of similar thing going on with tense where in some contexts you have to indicate this piece of time information. Uh, or in some languages, and in other contexts, you don't have to indicate this time information. So for English, it's a language where evidentiality is a completely optional. You can add some words to express it, phenomenon, and then tense, especially with like the past-present distinction, is obligatory. Yeah, like mostly, mostly obligatory. I think everything is everything is kind of a continuum, right? Yeah, I, I definitely am always wary of anyone who has discrete and absolute categories for things because every time you're like, it's obligatory, you'll find like a context in English like that narrative present where you're like, oh no, it's broken my brain. Whereas if you take a like, let's just look at what the language is doing and build up our analysis, uh, it causes a lot less existential anxiety. And that's the other thing about looking at, you know, what a language is doing is that it's often useful to look at sort of internally based on whatever this, you know, language does in really unambiguous cases where it's tense. That's what we can use as our diagnostic for these more ambiguous cases. So if English didn't have past tense either, then maybe we would say that the will was a future tense. But because English does this thing uh, with suffixes generally or irregular forms of the verb to be past, then we can say, well, will is clearly doing something that's different from that. And it seems like it makes more sense if we group will in with can and might and should rather than grouping will in with the sort of past ed uh, ending. Yeah, I think that's fair enough to start with the kind of examples of what we have that are people are very strongly expressing the kind of reliable feelings about the grammar and work up from there. So there's a quote that says this really pithily. 
which is languages differ essentially in what they must convey and not in what they may convey, uh, which is from Roman Jakobson in a 1959 book. And that's really pithy because it lets us say, well, languages can all talk about time or they can all talk about sources of evidence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they all have tense or they all have evidentiality because those are the grammatical reflexes of, of those things in the real world. Yeah, and just as we talked about English not having grammatical evidentiality, we have languages that don't have grammatical marking of tense. And the thing I find interesting about these examples is when we don't have something, like English speakers are like, well, of course we can get by without evidentiality. And then it's a bit more of a leap for someone who's used to speaking a language with grammatical tense, imagining speaking a language without one. But if a language must convey something with tense, that's going to be very different to being able to talk about time more generally without it being part of the grammar. Right, because even if a language doesn't have, you know, specific things that only do tense stuff, they're going to have words like yesterday or tomorrow or in the future or in the past or something like that. And that's still going to let you convey that. Yeah. It's it's similar again to like doing number on on words. So you know, we have dog and dogs in English, but we could also just have one dog and two dog and many dog, and we would still be able to convey that information, even though um, we wouldn't have the specific additional grammatical thing that's conveying that information. And so languages like Vietnamese and Thai and Mandarin and Burmese all don't have these grammatically obligatory markers. People will, if they need to in context, use words in much the same way in English we talk about, you know, tomorrow or later or whatever, but they don't have that same obligatory verb marking. I think that there's a, a sort of like Latin-based <laughs> prejudice that uh, a lot of, especially kind of European tradition of approaching language has, which is like, well, if it's not a prefix or a suffix, it's not grammar. And that's not what we're saying, because you could have a, a short little word, like a Mandarin, for example, has a has a question particle that you just put in sentences to make them a question. And that's a grammatical feature. English doesn't have a obligatory extra word to add to questions just to make them questions. But that's a case where you do have something that's obligatorily grammatical. So it's not saying that there aren't other obligatory grammatical features that you can do, even if your language is a bunch of short words rather than fewer longer words. But it's, you know, is this obligatory? Is this something you have to add to something? Yeah, if there was a part, if, if we had to say now in English any time we talked about the present, then that's as much a choice of grammar because of its obligatoriness, not just because it's something that sticks on the end of a verb. So one sort of interesting example that came up for me recently when it comes to languages having tense is Scottish Gaelic, which is a language that I studied briefly when I was uh, like in middle school. <laughs> and then uh, I've been returning to because I added Scottish Gaelic to Duolingo and, you know, like it's a language. So, uh, And something that's interesting about Scottish Gaelic is that it kind of doesn't really, for the most part, have a present tense. Ah, interesting. So... You can obviously, once you start thinking about each language has a different way of approaching segmenting time up into grammatical tenses, uh, it can be interesting to look across languages as to how they segment them. So Vietnamese doesn't segment time up into any specific grammatical tenses. And then a language like Scottish Gaelic has, so it has a future and a past. Is that what happens? Right. Well, so the thing that makes me hedge it a lot that say kind of doesn't really mm -hmm. is because the only verb that has a present tense form is be, to be. Okay. And that's kind of a big one. <laughs> it, right. It's a really important verb and it does a whole lot of stuff. Um, and then all of the other verbs have future forms and past forms. And then they also have, and this is where you get a little bit tricky, they also have forms like the sort of de-verbal noun form. So if you have a verb like see, there's no just like, I see. Okay. That's not a thing you can say in Scottish Gaelic. Uh, Irish, I think, works differently. So I'm not talking about Irish. I don't know how Irish works. I'm trying really hard to not respond with, hmm, I see. <laughs> so you can say things like I am in Gaelic, but you can't just say I see. What you want to say instead, if you're talking about the present, is I am seeing. Okay. Because you are using the be verb to do the present heavy lifting. Exactly. And so you can say, I am seeing, I was seeing, I will be seeing. Um, and this all uses the same form of seeing, which is the sort of nouny form. Um, mm -hmm. The same one that you could use for something like seeing is great. 
Then you also have separate forms of the verb to see, which mean will see and saw. So in the future, you can say, I will be seeing or I will see. And in the past, you can say, I saw or I was seeing. But in the present, all you have is I'm seeing. There's no just like I see. It's a bit like the English future in terms of obligatoriness being a slightly squishy concept. Right. So obligatory is slightly different. And this is why like, it kind of has a present because to be conjugates everywhere in all of the different forms. And it's also kind of weird because have, which you might think is also a sort of pretty basic verb, is expressed in Gaelic by saying something is at someone. So if I say I have a cat, I would literally say something like a cat is at me. And that's how I say have. So again, you can just use be hmm. to convey have because, you know, it's got this sort of idiomatic construction. And this was something that confused me when I was first learning Gaelic in middle school, because they only taught us the verb to be. Right. And they taught it to us in a whole bunch of tenses and stuff. And they taught us these forms, you know, like will be seeing and was seeing and am, am seeing all with the same one form. And I was like, guys, I just, aren't you going to teach us any other verbs at some point rather than just this one, you know, like, seeing form. Uh, like, surely there are more verbs in this language. So you were going into it with your English speaker category expectations. Right. And on the one hand, being an English speaker kind of gave me an advantage because English also kind of does this in a lot of contexts, right? Like English often says something like, I am seeing or I am eating or I am walking down the street rather than I walk down the street or I eat or I see. English actually does this more than a lot of European languages. Uh, some people have proposed that English does this thing because of influence from Scottish Gaelic, and this link has not been proven, so it is probably not actually true. It would be a fun hypothesis if it was true, but it's not. But like English does do something similar, just not quite as robustly. And uh, yeah, it was really confusing to me because I was coming from having learned, you know, French, where I was given all of these verb forms, and then they were trying to keep it easy for the Gaelic learners and just give us the kind of minimum stuff that you need, because you really can get very far with only to be. So we've seen some languages with a couple of tense distinctions, like English or Scots Gaelic. Uh, we say in languages with no tense distinctions. And if we go the other way, we can look at languages that have multiple tense distinctions beyond what we see in languages like English. And they segment that passage of time up into much smaller categories. Yes, I love more tenses. Yeah, once you see this, you're like, we are really underperforming <laughs> in the tense category department. It's always, it's always really exciting to see something you don't have. And you're like, ooh. The examples I've always heard of have come from the area of Papua New Guinea, which just has, like, wonderful levels of language diversity. Pa Papua New Guinea has, like, a sixth of the languages in the world, right? Yeah. It's like a thousand languages. Like, islands and mountains all do great things for linguistic diversity. The Tifal is a language of Papua New Guinea in the Ok family, and it has uh, at least six tense distinctions. So there is a present tense. Then there is a yesterday past a distant past and a very remote past. And then going the other way, there is a near future and a distant future. Ooh, very nice. I like it. And these are all distinct suffixes that are added to the verb to indicate the time relative to now of something that you're talking about. And, you know, again, it's one of those things where there are ways of saying this in English, but they're not as obligatory or as like directly encoded in some sort of obligatory thing, you know, because you can always say like a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, or, you know, sometimes people make this distinction between will and gonna, but, you know, you don't have this sort of robust way of distinguishing between these different, you know, remote past and, and just simple past. Or if I talk about when I was in school, I'm probably using the distant past rather than the yesterday past. You know, context does a lot of heavy lifting, and we often don't give it enough credit when it comes to things like marking time. Well, yeah, and because you might, in some contexts, talk about when I was in school as the recent past because you're contrasting that with something that happened a thousand years ago. And then in other contexts, you might talk about it as the remote past if you're talking with somebody who graduated last year. And, you know, a, a language may have particular grammatical categories, but sometimes when you look at how they're used, there are particular conventions. So I don't know specifically for TFAL, 
but it may be that the very remote past is only used for like origins and legends and myths and those kind of things. And they're not for like the, the time that humanity has been living like they are now. So, uh, there's kind of multiple things happening here. There's the, the tense marking. It's how it fits with actual time. And then there are also genre conventions, uh, like we talked about with the English narrative past that uses the present. Right. But again, like, even if you have a language where there's, you know, a tense that indicates this sort of, you know, myth and legend type past, uh, it's kind of like how, you know, in English you use a once upon a time to signal that something's a fairy tale. But you can also use once upon a time to signal that you're talking about something as if it's a fairy tale. When you say, you know, once upon a time, these two linguists got together and started a podcast. <laughs> and this doesn't mean that, like, it's a myth, but it's we're talking about like Lingthusiasm's origin story as if it were a myth, using the sort of myth frame, even though yes. uh, very clearly this happened in like a fathomable past where we were actually there and it's not like Cinderella where it's a, you know, fairy tale story. Yeah, so context and genre are really important when we're thinking about how language is as used as well as the kind of abstracted structure of it. Yeah, and I think it's neat to, uh, you know, emphasize how these different types of tenses can be subverted so that, like, there's a sort of canonical use and then there's a sort of playful use where you can put something as if it's in that space as well. So we talk about tense as, like, it's time, but it's not always, strictly speaking, time. And another thing that comes up a lot when you talk about tense is other kinds of relationships that people can have to time. So, Sometimes you talk about something as being an ongoing thing, or you talk about something as happening at one discrete point, or you talk about certain attitudes that you have towards whether something is happening or not. And those are generally lumped into different categories, like mood and aspect, which can relate to tense, but aren't exactly the same thing as tense. So I think we have to save those for another episode. We've already talked about evidentiality, which is often lumped into those categories. We're talking about tense now. We've still got aspect and modality to look forward to. Yeah, so stay tuned for more things about how we think about time. But this one is just about where it is with respect to the sort of personal timeline. Once you start looking at the kind of variation, and you're like, oh, I would like three past tense distinctions. Uh, another thing that would be very nifty is a grammatical tense that is specifically for the current day. Ooh. If we want to give it a, a Latin A category, the hodiernal tense from Latin for today. Uh, it's always so much fancier when you say it in Latin, for real. I know. Like, it's really fun. I always try to, like, not get too bogged down in the terminology, but then sometimes learning that there's actually a, a fancy terminological word for something is the most delightful part. Um, so you could have a hodiernal tense. Hodiernal tense is in Muera, which is a Bantu language of Tanzania. And apparently Gretchen, the passé composé in French in like the 17th century was possibly used as hodiernal. Oh, that's neat. Okay. So the passé composé in French, if you were to literally translate it into, into English, it's like putting have <laughs> before all of your, of your past verbs. So things like I have written, I have gone, I have seen, I have walked, except it's used in French as a sort of general past. So you would say something like I have walked when you, in English, you would say I walked. And there is this other form in French that's kind of equivalent to I walked, which is only used in like literature now. And it's not used in ordinary conversations or even in like casual writing. So it's one of those cases where, you know, something starts out as this sort of like restricted casual, you know, only today or something tense. And then it gets sort of gradually expands into being used as a sort of default unmarked past tense. And then the other one becomes literary. Also a good reminder that you know, the role of tenses aren't fixed and static forever and language is always changing and evolving and maybe one day English will have something we can call a definite grammatical future, just in the way that French for a brief period in the 17th century may have had hodernal tense for a while. That is neat. And certain, you know, words that start out as being sort of very concrete can achieve this level of grammaticalization. And this is a thing that I really enjoy about grammaticalization, because when words become used grammatically, they often also get shorter. Yet the original form, the concrete one, can't necessarily shorten the same way as the grammatical one. Uh, so here's an example. You can't say, I'm gonna the airport. No, that does not sit with me. You can say, I'm gonna go to the airport. Yes, that's fine. And you think of going to and gonna as being equivalent to each other. And they kind of are, but not in the literal sense. If I'm like, I'm gonna the airport, mm, mm, 
mm, mm, something's broken doesn't work. Whereas you can say, I'm gonna go to the airport, I'm gonna fly to Rome or something like this, but you can't do it in that bit. And the same thing with will, which starts out meaning something like want or wish before it meant a future. Okay, like as in like a legal will. Yeah, exactly. Like a thing that you write. Yeah. But when it refers to the future, it can get shortened into LL as in I'll or you'll or something like this. But you can't have my last old and testament. <laughs> I, I, I think my brain got broken by trying to think of that does not work. No. No, it just doesn't work. So even though will starts out as meaning want or wish, this old bit, that can only be used in a sort of tense sort of way. Um, so maybe that's where, if if we develop a future tense in English, that's where it will develop. But that would be kind of interesting, because that would be putting future tense on I and you and other pronouns, rather than putting it on the verb like we currently do. And there is definitely cases where we have tense being on things other than the verb in other languages. So English wouldn't be the first language to do this. But when you're used to thinking about tense as being a feature of the verb and being kind of marked somewhere very close to the verb, it is definitely uh, – English wouldn't be the first language to do this. Uh, one example of a language that can do this is Kyadilt, which is an Australian language. And if you wanted to have a difference between the sentence, I will go to the beach and I went to the beach, you mark it with a suffix on the noun beach. So like, I go to the present beach, I go to the future beach, I go to the former beach. Yes. I mean, I guess you can kind of do this in some restricted context in English. Like you can say, you know, my former teacher or like the late Mr. So-and-so or like this is an ex-parrot. And that can refer to something that is no longer whatever the thing is. But these are suffixes that go onto the noun in the way that we think of tense suffixes going onto a verb. Right. But these are specifically talking about like, it's not that it's not a beach anymore. No, it is still very much a existing ongoingly beach. That's interesting. It's just that I'm not there anymore. Okay. Sometimes we talk about language being constrained by, you know, the the biological laws of human anatomy. Like there are certain sounds we can make, there are certain sounds we can't make, there are certain ways we can configure our hands, there are certain ways we can't configure our hands. And sometimes we talk about language as being constrained by the fact that basically all of its speakers of, of human languages are on this sort of pale blue dot that's revolving around the sun and we have, you know, words for days and years because we all share this as part of the human experience. And I think maybe we <laughs> another element of this is talk about languages being constrained, constrained by physics. So we don't have any uh, natural human languages that have words for like the tenses involved in time travel, because time travel so far is not a thing. So none of the languages have had to develop one, them. But in theory, this could happen. This would be very difficult to approach as an English speaker, because as we've kind of demonstrated in this episode, one of the ways we test the obligatoriness and the grammaticality of tense as opposed to talking about time is to check people's intuitions because if something's obligatory then like removing it or changing it should change people's intuitions and if you're talking about using past tense we expect that events that are bounded by the past can't be interacted with in the same way as events that will happen in the future and we use that as part of our intuition building can you imagine gretchen how much linguistic theory would be broken if suddenly a whole bunch of sentences could be valid because people could time travel. Right. So saying something like, I was there tomorrow, or I will be there yesterday, like suddenly maybe you need to be able to do this because you've time traveled. The Cambridge grammar of English is already big <laughs> enough, and this is my main argument against time travel. <laughs> it's already like 2,000 pages, and uh, if it's time travel, we need to like double the size of the tense chapter. It's going to be a lot of work. Could be fun, though. I, I think it could keep linguists employed for a long time, figuring out how to do this. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. 
I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. To listen to bonus episodes, join our Discord chat room, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include a special neural net generated episode of Lingthusiasm, where we read out the results of the neural net, the future of English, and onomatopoeia. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Dopiarella, and our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!